Hey everybody, this is Jimmy. Welcome back to another episode of the Jimmy Tingle Show. Today we have my friend David Korn on the show, folks, and his new book is a New York Times bestseller, and it is coming out in paperback on September 12th. So you'll be seeing this interview in time to get down to the bookstore or go to Amazon and get that book because it is an awesome book. Let me just read you some of the, the description of this book. American Psychosis, a historical investigation of how the Republican Party went crazy. That's right, folks. Number one, New York Times bestselling author and investigative reporter David Kahn tells the wild and harrowing story of the Republican Party's decade-long relationship with far-right extremism, bigotry, and paranoia. A fast-paced, rollicking, behind-the-scenes account of how the GOP since the 1950s has encouraged and exploited extremism, bigotry, and paranoia. Why? To gain power. Corn reveals the hidden history of how the party of Lincoln, Lincoln, the greatest president ever, how the party of Lincoln forged alliances with extremists, kooks, racists, and conspiracy mongers, and fostered fear, anger, and resentment to win elections, and how this led to Donald Trump's triumph and the transformation of the GOP into a Trump personality cult that foments and bolsters the crazy and dangerous excesses of the right. The Trump incited insurrectionist attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021 was no aberration. American psychosis shows it was a continuation of the long and deep-rooted Republican alliance and practice of boosting and weaponizing the rage and derangement of the right. Now, here are two reviews I'm going to read. One is from a conservative a Republican and one is from uh, Rachel Maddow. This is Charlie Sykes. He's a lifelong Republican, wonderful talk show host up in Wisconsin. He's got a great podcast called The Bulwark. I listen to it all the time, and I would highly recommend it. Charlie Sykes, lifelong Republican, writes, in this searing and deeply reported work, Korn recounts how the modern GOP succumbed to the extremism, alternative realities, and paranoia that spread the American psychosis that exploded on January 6th. A desperately important read from Charlie Sykes, author of How the Right Lost Its Mind. This is a Republican. And of course, uh, Rachel Maddow says, from MSNBC, Corn is a great journalist. I love the way he thinks. I love the way he writes. I'm so glad he's done a super readable modern history of the right. We just need smart, digestible history about this stuff right now. American psychosis is perfectly timed. Relevant history for where we are. Right now, that's from Rachel Maddow, host of The Rachel Maddow Show. And David Korn is a veteran Washington journalist and political commentator. He is the Washington Bureau Chief for Mother Jones Magazine and an analyst for MSNBC. Welcome to the show, Mr. David Korn. Good to be with you, Mr. Jimmy Tingle. <laughs> it's great to see you again. And I say this all the time when I see David, but I'm so happy for you because I know how much work went into this book. I know how much work you put into the work of Mother Jones and, and MSNBC and doing all these book dates and all these interviews and everything. So I was extremely grateful for you being here today. But I'm just really happy for you that the book took off and has been on the New York Times bestseller list. It's a great read. And it's coming out in paper book on uh, September 12th, folks. So it's a great thing to start off, kick off the fall with and just to put in perspective where we are politically in this country right now. So, David, uh, I wanted to ask you, did you watch the Republican debate the other night? I did after the fact, so I could <laughs> fast forward through some of the more most inane parts. And it just was, I think, a great encapsulation of where the party is now. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm reminded of the line from Succession, for those of you who watched, in which Logan Roy looks at his three children and says, you are not serious people. <laughs> Looking at this bunch of, of, of what is it, eight people on the stage, it was like there was not a lot of seriousness. They didn't deal with the bigger biggest issues. They were all trying to basically push the the grievance buttons that Donald Trump has, you know, did so well in doing and reaching the presidency in 2016. Um, they said things that were not true. They, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy, who is now like the golden boy of the GOP pack, 
called climate change a hoax. Mm -hmm. Nikki Haley said it's real, but really we don't have to do anything about it because it's the fault of the Chinese and, 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 and the Indians in, you know, as in the country India. Um, it was pretty, pretty uh, low in terms of intellectual sustenance, vigor, content. Uh, there was a lot of posing and posturing for the MAGA extremism that's taken over the Republican Party. Uh, it was, you know, it, but it, but it, as I say, this is, none of this was surprising. Mm -hmm. Trump has transformed the party in the sense that he is taking it to, uh, and this is, I guess, the pun intended, the logical extreme, <laughs> uh, which is kind of, kind of the point of my book, that for 70 years, the Republican Party has encouraged and exploited far-right extremism, bigotry, paranoia, conspiracy theory, often more on this side and not front and center. Um, but you saw Newt Gingrich, Sarah Palin, and others over the past few decades speaking you know, to the paranoia on the right and accusing Democrats of being, you know, of, of plotting and scheming to destroy America. Glenn Beck had a show on Fox, all the Republican leadership went on in which he said Obama had a, had a secret plot to destroy America mm -hmm. and he was going to set up concentration camps and, and ruin the economy so he could become emperor. I mean, they've been doing this for a long time, yeah. but it was more or less to the side. Trump came along and said, I can put this in the spotlight. You know, I with conspiracy theories and claiming that the Democrats are in league with Antifa, black radicals and communists, literally to annihilate the America you love and your suburbs, meaning your white suburbs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you have a Republican Party that has been fed so much red meat that it's about to have a heart attack. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it just wants more and more and more. And that's what you see these, these Republican candidates doing or trying to do following Trump's uh, strategy. Uh, but, you know, the thing is, the party already has Trump, so they, they don't need other Trumps out there as Ron DeSantis. I don't know if it's DeSantis, 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 Dore Me Santis. But anyway, According NPR calls to Donald him DeSantis. Trump, it's DeSantimonious. <laughs> but, yeah, but NPR says DeSantis. So if anyone knows, it's going to be NPR and how to pronounce something. Right. But nevertheless... Um, you know, he went out there with this whole anti-woke agenda, which he, you know, curtailed a bit during the Republican debate, because it turns out it's not that popular. It's popular in conservative media, it's popular in Fox, but it hasn't been working with the Republican primary electorate, you know, at least hasn't gotten him support. But he, you know, but, you know, it, it is his way of trying to out-Trump. It was his way of trying to out-Trump Trump. Trump. In, in any event, I think the GOP debate ultimately is utterly inconsequential that unless Donald Trump drops dead something or something like that happens, he is going to be the nominee. Well, David, As, you know, they, these guys won't attack him. They won't go after him. Anyone who has accounts, I'm not talking about Chris Christie or, or Asa Hutchinson. And by, and if you're listening at home, you get extra bonus points if you can identify who Asa Hutchinson is. <laughs> um, but if, you know, so it's so what they kind of say is interesting in terms of a reflection of where they think the party's at, but it makes, I think, very little difference in what's going to happen with the Republican contest. Right. Well, David, just to put in perspective, the theme of your book is that the party has a history and it culminated with Trump in, in January 6th, but it's been going on for a long time. For those mm -hmm. of the, the listeners and viewers who are not familiar with your book, just give some examples out of the book of where right. they were doing things like, for example, the Bertha issue, the whole Bertha issue. Well, we'll go, let me, let me yeah. start at the beginning. Yeah, sure. So, you know, so, so uh, you know, the, what, I, what I describe is that this relationship between the Republican Party, the GOP, and far-right extremists going back to really starting after World War II. And it begins with McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. When you had Joe McCarthy uh, you know, going out there and saying that the Democrats weren't wrong. They were evil. They were part of a communist plot. They wanted to literally take over America 
and it was part of a plot that had infiltrated um, unions, corporations, PTA <laughs> meetings, local theater groups, every, everything. Uh, the commies were out there. You know, it, it wasn't that the Russia was bad. It was this internal subversive threat that was that was the true enemy. And initially, Eisenhower and other Republicans went along with this, even though they knew it was nothing except bullshit. Event, and, and eventually, McCarthy went too far. That the Republicans were able to somewhat distance themselves from him in the in, in the mid fifties, late fifties. But then, in nineteen sixty four, when Barry Goldwater is running for president, he basically makes an alliance with the John Birch Society, which was McCarthyism on steroids. It was their, you know, the, the, the Birchers believed that not that the commies were a threat, but they were already had already taken over the entire media, churches, um, every educational institution. Uh, it was not just putting fluoride in water. They were, you know, trying to imp impose uh, a, a UN regime to, to the dictating America. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, they had weather machines. Uh, it was just, you know, controlling the weather, that is. It was just complete nutso stuff. But yet, uh, Barry Goldwater would not distance or disavow the, the John Birchers. He, instead, he recruited them and used them to win the Republican primary in 1964 against Nelson Rockefeller, a moderate established Republican. And these guys, I mean, they were basically the QAnoners of their day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, you know, they try to keep them a little bit to the side, but he used them for fundraising and foot soldiers and refused to, um, to, to denounce them. And so you had that alliance. You have Nixon in, the, in a few years later making alliances with Southern racists, the most virulent bigots, to win primaries um, and then to win um, general elections. In the 70s, you had the new right and religious right, which both sort of evolved together, saying that Democrats and liberals were God-hating atheists and, 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 and gay rights activists wanted to uh, basically kill Christianity and wanted to kill Americans who weren't gay. You had members of the moral majority going out there and saying, that it was okay to kill people who were homosexuals because the Bible said you could. And, you know, and rather than put this, you know, be aghast at this, Ronald Reagan and the Republican Party totally embraced it. They embraced this extremism. So again and again and again, you see Republicans making common cause with the most extreme, bigoted, hatred-fueling, paranoid-pushing um, elements of the conservative movement, you know, they, they, they don't do it front and center, but they, you know, go speak to them, they embrace them. And this happened later with, with both uh, George Bush's and Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson had, you know, uh, the, 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 the um, Christian coalition, uh, a group of evangelical Americans that he organized for political purposes. And Pat Robertson, who died recently, was a complete uh, nutcase. He put out a book saying that the Rothschild family and Kissinger and the Queen of England and others were part of a global world conspiracy involving pedophiles and, 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 and others, very much like the QAnon of today. And he claimed that even that George H.W. Bush was part of this conspiracy as an unwitting dupe. But what happens, George Bush, when he's running for president, goes to Pat Robertson, embraces him, speaks to the Christian Coalition because he wants the votes and, and the money. So again, it's authenticating and legitimizing the worst of the worst of, of far-right extremism. Mm -hmm. Newt Gingrich did the same. Sarah Palin did the same. You mentioned birtherism. That's how, you know, uh, that's how Donald Trump came to be a conservative hero. He took on this crazy theory that had no merit that Barack Obama was born in Kenya, and it was racist. And it was tied into the idea that he was a secret Muslim and a secret socialist, and he had secret plans for annihilating America. And Donald Trump, you know, kept claiming that he had proof, he had evidence, he had none of that. But it was what propelled him to become a conservative champion that led to, you know, that led to his candidacy for president in 2016. And, it, you know, it ends up with Trump becoming a president, pushing a gazillion conspiracy theories including the big one that um, the election was stolen from him, 
which leads to January 6th. And what is he doing these days? He's campaigning that the people who were insurrectionist rioters on January 6th should be pardoned. And, that, and then he says, we love these people. He's hailing them and praising them. Uh, so this is a full frontal embrace by the leading Republican of violence and treason. Mm -hmm. Well, David, I imagine you get this question a lot going around to book readings and on the air or when you do radio, et cetera. Uh, is there anything like that on, on the left? It, people think it sounds unfair or hyperpartisan when I say there isn't. This is asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden is not out there encouraging Antifa and working with Antifa and praising Antifa or anarchists. He runs for president in 2020 saying, I want to be president for everybody. I want to bring this country together. You know, I think the Republicans are wrong in policy. Uh, I think Donald Trump has been, you know, reprehensible and irresponsible. But I would like to be the president of everybody. Donald Trump runs for president saying that the Democrats are evil. You, can, you, you can't find an equivalent to Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Bobert or, or, or Jim Jordan mm -hmm. on the left. Yeah, there are far left members of, of, of Congress, and they have been, but they're not out there pushing conspiracy theories on the other side. You don't have this, you know, uh, this long record of, of, of Democrats or Democratic presidential candidates who go on and say Alex Jones is right, who go on and, and say, you know, QAnon is right. It's yeah. something very particular to the Republican Party, um, and there is and there is no equivalent uh, on the other side. Well, there are people on the left, you know, and you know, and others who may have crazy ideas and notions or be conspiratorial, very extreme in their views. They don't have the same relationship with the Democratic leadership, and perhaps more importantly, the Democratic leadership does not spend time trying to court them and bring them into the fold. While with Trump, you see again and again and again, he and his other and his acolytes keep appealing to the, the, the extremists of the far right. You have Tucker Carlson going on the air just recently, not on the air, I guess on Twitter, um, saying, you know, to Trump, well, you know, these people want to assassinate you. The left wants to kill you. Mm. All this is totally inflaming. Right the passions and hatreds and paranoia of the right. And there's nobody who does that at that high level um, on the left. All right. So Rupert Murdoch, when he was on trial under oath, he f famously said, I don't know how much it's been reported. Maybe it's not that famous. But he said, listen, I'm not pulling for the red. I'm not pulling for the blue. I'm pulling for the green. It's about money and Fox Channel and Fox News and all of it is really about the bottom line. So when you when you talk about the media, whether it's talk radio or do you, or it's television, do you think what's driving these media companies is the economic incentive that there's a, a willing audience there that wants to hear this and that will be it'll reinforce some of their worst instincts? Do you think that's what's driving that there? And then on the political side, everybody on the stage the other night was a supporter of Trump. They're not all, they're not all, you know, conspiracy theorists, right? But they all supported Donald Trump. So what was driving all of those people? The Nikki Haley's, the Chris Christie's, the Asa Hus Hutchinson initially was with him. Asa Hutchinson and Chris Christie are pretty explicit in their criticism. Right. They're off the right reservation about. now, but five years yeah. ago, now they are, but they, five years yeah, ago, yes. they were not. Chris Christie was very much on Trump's team yeah. until he didn't get a job from Trump. But what was driving um, them then? Just, well, let's, well, let's, let's start, let's start with the, with the Fox and the media. Um, I, I, Rupert Murdoch is a conservative. He likes conservatives, no regulation, no taxes, or lower taxes that serves his interests. But I think, but just as importantly, he realizes that there is this market for far-right extremism on, on the air. And, you know, you know, Fox only gets three to four million viewers a night. 
in a country the size of 330 million people. That's 1%, but it still is enough to make a boatload of money. And so he wants to keep that audience um, entertained and, and revved up and angry. And he does that by confirming their prejudices, their biases, and their most conspiratorial notions. And we saw in the documentation that came out of the Dominion Voting Systems lawsuit, um, you know, in, in, in which Fox ended up having to settle for, what is it, $785 million or something? Mm -hmm. So incredible figure. We saw in that case documentation come out in which it was clear Tucker Carlson and, and other hosts, other executives, and Murdoch realized that if they did not amplify and confirm Donald Trump's big lie, the disinformation that was coming forward from Rudy Giuliani and Cindy Powell and all the others who were, you know, trying to bamboozle the public, um, if they didn't, you know, lean into that, they would lose audience mm -hmm. share. That Their audience would go to OANN, another network, or Newsmax, another far right network, where they were all conspiracy all the time. And so it revealed Fox to be a for-profit propaganda outlet. Right. Nothing journalistic here at all. They just want to keep the audience, and you know, and if they you know, and they were just scared, you know, poopless of 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 alienating their audience by by telling the truth that the election was not stolen, was not rigged, and that Joe Biden was the legitimate president. So they, it was just, it was everything revealed that you ever suspect about Fox. You know, they don't care. They come up with, they're more about talking points and truth. Right. And he, and, and he would, he, he testified accordingly. That's what he basically said that we're in it for, we're in it for the money. What's going on with the rest of the party, though? The pro the problem is not with elected officials and people like Mitch McConnell. The problem is that tens of millions of Americans believe the swill that Donald Trump has been slinging, not just the big lie about the election, but, but everything else, conspiracy theories or disinformation about COVID. They believe that. They believe that Trump is their guy. They don't believe that he is a criminal or they don't care if he's a misogynist or racist. They, you know, they are part of this Trump cult. And that is the majority of the Republican Party. So other Republicans know if they go against that, they will put their careers on the line and they're likely to lose. So it's just a total profile and cowardice that we see across the board that whether it's Lindsey Graham, Mitch McConnell, whoever you want to point to, that almost all the major Republicans, you know, they refuse to vote against Trump during impeachment, uh, convict him. And they, you know, even the ones who criticized him, Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy, for the January 6th riot and, and blamed him, you know, within weeks were back on his side and saying what, you know, what a fine fellow he is and that they would support him if he ran for president. Right. He got the nomination again. So they, but they are, you know, they're not so much afraid of him. They're afraid of these tens of millions of Americans. And that's why I call the book American Psychosis, mm -hmm. who have been struck by this political you know, irrationality. They believe things that are not real. They believe the election was stolen. Right. They believe Antifa and BOM are in league with Joe Biden and they're coming to destroy your town and village. <laughs> um, it's, you know, th this is, yeah. you know, where the Republican Party has gone. Okay. And tens of millions of Americans are at that point. And so that's why the Republican Party itself can't move from this position without basically pulling itself apart. All right, David, let's close it up with, I have one, I want you to make a prediction. Will Joe right. Biden, barring any extreme, you know, health issues on any either side, will Joe Biden be victorious in 2024? Will the Democrats, will the blue wave, the long awaited blue wave, <laughs> The elusive blue wave. Will it actually hit the shores of America this 2024 election season? Jimmy, I can't even tell you what I'm, what I'm going to have for dinner tomorrow night. 
anyone who makes a prediction about 2024 uh, is not worth interviewing. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind yeah. is that Biden had 7 million more votes than Trump right. last time. Right. And, and to be quite brazen about it, Trump's voters are older and they live in less healthy areas of the country. So that means in the, next, in the four years between the elections, a lot more Trump voters are dying than Biden voters are dying. And if you look at younger voters, they're breaking towards Democrats. So demographically, it should be you know good for the Democrats, but our system is crazy. You can become president with, with and you can get 10 million votes less or more than the other guy and still become president because you do well in a few states in the electoral uh, college. Right. So uh, it's really hard to, to game this out. And with Trump's, you know, gazillion indictments and possible to know what, what impact that's going to have, uh, even on the Republican primary race. So all I can say is hold on to your hats, <laughs> buckle up, get a scotch ready, because it's just going to be a wild ride between now and then. Well, David, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks again for doing it. The book is American Psychosis, and it's coming out in paperback on September 12th. So get that either through Amazon or you can go to David Cohen. What's your website, David? They can get it on, on Amazon or any other book place. If they want to subscribe to my uh, newsletter, which comes out one or two times a week yep. and has information about the book, but just other writings about what's happening, they can go to davidcorn.com. DavidCorn.com. The name of his newsletter is Our Land. It's really great. You got a lot of great articles on there, David. And of course, please support Mother Jones. David is the yes. Washington Bureau Chief Editor. And, and thanks again for being on the show, David, and continue success and keep the faith, my friend. Get some rest. Yes. You got a long, we got a long road, man, 2024. But I'm optimistic yes. and I'm just going to tell you why, okay? The issues that so many people care about, guns, climate, choice, and immigration reform, okay? Those four issues, I think those that's the Democrats' wheelhouse. And I think, and if Biden starts talking about recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction and starts using his son as an example of what millions of people are going through and gets behind that issue and just connects with the average voter like he has and continues on the wave of accomplishments that he's been racking up with infrastructure and, and everything else, the green economy. I think we're, I think I'm optimistic. That's all I can say. I'm optimistic. And the president might be in the Fulton County jail. That's the other thing. <laughs> yes. Well, we, 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 there's so much that we don't know. Um, and all I can say is, in the next year, we're going to need lots of laughs, so keep them laughing. All right. And here's one final thought for you. If the president and those 18 people that he that were checked into the Fulton County Jail the other day and got the mug shots, if they end up as residents of the Fulton County Jail, I guarantee you prison reform will be front and center on the Republican platform. <laughs> as well as... The quality of food in prison. Right. Okay. <laughs> Take care, David. Thank you so much. You too, Jimmy. Bye-bye.